In this week's Weekly Funny Jokes, we bring you our best joke compilation of the week. These jokes are sure to make you laugh, from the first one to the last one. These are our story jokes, which we love to generate. This week, we bring you five jokes, starting with a joke about the young and the restless, until we end with a joke about a vasectomy and a brother's wish. So, sit back, get the popcorn, and get ready to laugh until your stomach ache. Our first story joke of the day is about the young and the restless. In today's cartoon story joke, this priest gets asked a simple favor. All right, folks, fasten your seat belts and hold on to your hats because we're about to embark on a journey that's going to leave you scratching your head in confusion until it all magically clicks into place. Strap in for the most thrilling roller coaster of questions marks you've ever experienced, but fear not, because by the end, you'll be nodding your head in agreement and laughing all the way. So, researchers have been getting down to the nitty-gritty of love, trying to figure out where exactly in our bodies we feel different kinds of love, romantic love, parental love, even love for strangers. It's like they're playing a game of emotional twister, but instead of left foot red, it's more like right hand romantic. Imagine this. Participants were asked to color in silhouettes of bodies to show where they felt bodily sensations when experiencing a certain type of love. Can you picture it? People sitting around, pens in hand, trying to pinpoint whether their self-love sensation is more of a left pinky or right kneecap kind of feeling. But here's the kicker. All types of love were felt in the head. I mean, we knew love could make your head spin, but who knew it was a full-on headlining act in the body sensation department? Some love even spread to the chest, while others were like, nah, I'm just gonna hang out in the head today. Thanks. And get this, love feelings formed a continuum with romantic, sexual, and parental love being felt more strongly than, say, love for strangers. It's like the body's love meter goes from full-on fireworks for your partner to a polite nod for the guy who holds the door open for you. But wait, there's more. Love isn't just about physical sensations. There's a mental intensity too. Apparently, the more your body feels the love, the more your mind's like, yeah, I'm into this which, honestly, explains a lot about those lovey-dovey couples who can't stop staring into each other's eyes. Now, let's not forget about emotions. Love and happiness are like the party animals of the emotional spectrum, sparking almost entire body activity. Meanwhile, depression's the party pooper, dampening feelings like it's raining on our emotional parade. And anger? Well... That's the one emotion that activates the arms. Because who doesn't want to throw a little love tap when they're mad? So, there you have it. Love is a wild ride, from head to toe, with twists, turns, and a whole lot of heart. And who knew science could make love even more fascinating? Just when you thought your heart couldn't get any fuller, along comes a study that proves love really does make the world go round, whether it's in your head, your heart, or even your pinky toe. But let the question mark roller coaster begin. So there's this priest doing his rounds, paying home visits to the elderly parishioners, spreading some love and spiritual guidance. He knocks on the door of this little old lady's house and she invites him in with a twinkle in her eye and a mischievous grin. Before the priest can even say a word about salvation or the afterlife, the old lady drops a bombshell. She's got a last wish, you see, and she's willing to shell out some serious cash, 600 bucks serious, to make it happen. But here's the catch. She wants some company, a little human interaction to brighten up her twilight years. Now, the priest's a bit taken aback. I mean, he's all about serving the Lord and spreading the good word, but this request, it's a bit out of left field. Still, he's a man of compassion, so he tells the old lady he'll see what he can do. As he steps outside, pondering how to fulfill this unusual request, he spots Michael, the neighborhood troublemaker, zipping by on his bike. Light bulb moment. The priest figures, hey, why not recruit Michael for some good old-fashioned companionship? After all, the kid could use a lesson in altruism, and the old lady could use some entertainment. 
So, he flags down Michael, lays out the situation, and dangles that sweet $600 carrot in front of him. Michael's eyes practically light up at the prospect of easy money, and without a second thought, he ditches the bike and rushes into the old lady's house faster than you can say, holy moly. Fast forward a few hours, and the priest, making his rounds again, notices the absence of Michael's bike outside the house. Uh-oh, he thinks. The old lady must have kicked the bucket. With a heavy heart, he ventures inside, expecting the worst. But what does he find? Michael, sprawled out on the bed, butt naked as the day he was born, looking like he just won the lottery. The priest's jaw practically hits the floor as he stammers out a question. Where's Anna? And Michael, without missing a beat, flashes a grin and delivers the punchline that seals the deal. Oh, she's off, drawing more money. <laughs> Our second story joke of the day is about a restaurant and its efficiencies. In today's story joke, we delve into the world of restaurants. Once upon a time, back in 1765 Paris, there was a guy named Boulanger. Now, this Boulanger character wasn't just your average soup vendor. He had big dreams and an even bigger sense of humor. His joint near the Louvre served up what he called restorative broths. But his real magic? It was in his motto, come to me, all who suffer from pain of the stomach, and I will restore you. A punny nod to both his broth's healing powers and a certain biblical invitation to find rest. But Boulanger wasn't just serving soup. He was starting a revolution. His broth business boomed, and soon his place became synonymous with good food and good vibes. However, not everyone was thrilled about Boulanger's success. The caterers, or traiteurs, felt like their turf was being invaded. They even took Boulanger to court. But guess what? Boulanger came out on top, securing his spot in culinary history. Now, while Boulanger might not have been the first to coin the term restaurant, his legacy lives on. And as for the English language, well, let's just say we've always had a thing for French flair. So next time you're dining out, raise a toast to Boulanger, the OG restaurateur who turned broth into brilliance and made restaurants sound way fancier than a plain old cook's shop or subtling house. Bon appétit. All right, folks, enough with the history lesson. Let's spice things up and hop aboard the restaurant roller coaster. It's time to buckle up and get ready for a wild ride through the tantalizing world of dining delights. Last week, we took some friends out to a new restaurant and noticed that the waiter who took our order carried a spoon in his shirt pocket. It seemed a little strange. When the waiter brought our water and cutlery, I noticed he also had a spoon in his shirt pocket. Then I looked around and saw that all the staff had spoons in their pockets. When the waiter came back to serve our soup, I asked, why the spoon? Well, he explained, the restaurant's owners hired a consultant to revamp all our processes. After several months of analysis, they concluded that the spoon was the most frequently dropped piece of cutlery. It represents a drop frequency of approximately three spoons per table per hour. If our staff are better prepared, we can reduce the number of trips back to the kitchen and save 15 manhors per shift. This will be a significant improvement on our efficiency. As luck would have it, I dropped my spoon and he was able to replace it with his spare. I should get another spoon next time I go to the kitchen instead of making an extra trip to get it right now. I was impressed. I also noticed that there was a string hanging from all the male waiters front of their pants. So, before he walked off, I asked the waiter, excuse me, but can you tell me why you have that string right there? Oh, certainly. Then he lowered his voice. Not everyone is so observant. He then started to explain. That consulting firm I mentioned also found that the male waiters can save time in the restroom by tying his string to the tip of you-know-what. We can pull the string which will lower our zip and pull it out without touching it. This will eliminate the need to wash our hands and thus shortening the time spent in the restroom by 76.39%. Wow, I said. 
That's amazing and very clever. But that immediately made me thought. So I asked, when you are finished, how do you put it back without touching it? Well, he answered, I don't know what the other waiters do, but I just use the spoon. <laughs> Our third story joke of the day is about a crocodile infested dam. In today's cartoon story joke, we bring you a crocodile invested story that will make you grin with laughter. Right, buckle up for a wild ride through history because we're diving into the world of animal fighting for prizes. And trust me, it's a real zoo out there. Back in ancient Rome, they didn't mess around when it came to entertainment. Picture this, massive arenas packed with cheering crowds, ready to witness some of the most epic showdowns this side of the Colosseum. First up, we've got chariot races, where drivers risked life and limb to navigate treacherous tracks, all for the glory of victory and maybe a shiny trophy or two. It was like NASCAR meets Mario Kart, but with way more horsepower and a lot fewer blue shells. Then there was Roman boxing, where fighters donned gloves with metal knuckles and duped it out like their lives depended on it. It was less about finesse and more about who could throw the hardest punch without breaking a hand. Talk about a knockout performance, but the real stars of the show were the animals. From ferocious lions to towering elephants, they were the main event, battling it out in the arena for the ultimate prize, survival. And let me tell you, it was a real jungle out there. Behind the scenes, it was a logistical nightmare. Trappers scoured the empire for exotic beasts, Trainers worked their magic to tame them, and then it was showtime. But hey, it wasn't all blood and guts. These animal fights were also a chance for the Romans to show off their creativity. Picture this, a gladiator facing off against a lion while riding an elephant. Now that's what I call entertainment. All right, hold on to your togas, folks. Let's set the stage with a tale of a legendary farmer named John and his crock-filled dam. So. The next time you complain about waiting in line for popcorn at the movies, just remember you've got nothing on the Romans when it comes to epic animal showdowns. So, there was this legendary farmer, Farmer John, whose farm was so grand, it could make even the sun jealous. And smack in the middle of it all was this massive dam, filled to the brim with crocodiles. Because, you know, every farm needs a little excitement to entertain. One day, Farmer John decided to live in things up a bit. He announced to the whole town that whoever could swim across the crocodile-infested dam would win some spectacular prizes. It was like the Olympics, but with much more teeth. On the big day, many fearless farmers showed up, ready to risk life and limb for fame and fortune. Farmer John, with his flair for the dramatic, laid out the prizes. His glorious farm, a mountain of cash, or his lovely daughter, Rachel. Talk about options. But before he could even finish his sentence, Farmer Billy was already halfway across, dodging crocs like he was born for it. The crowd erupted into cheers, and Farmer Billy emerged on the other side, dripping wet but victorious. As Farmer John, now standing on the other side of the dam, shouted to Farmer Billy, Do you want my farm? Farmer Bill shouted back, No thanks, I already have a farm. Then Farmer John shouted, Then you probably want all of my money. Farmer Billy shouted back, No, I don't need your money. Farmer John then shouted, So, it's my beautiful daughter Rachel that you want as your trophy. No, Farmer Billy shouted back, I don't want your daughter. She's very beautiful, but I think I can still do better. Perplexed, Farmer John scratched his head. Well then, Billy, what incarnation do you want? With a twinkle in his eye, Billy grinned and replied, I just want the idiot who pushed me into the water. <laughs> Our fourth story joke of the day is about a breathalyzer and the aftermath of a heavy night out. In today's story joke, we take a wild ride into the world of the tipsy breathalyzer. Ah, the wild ride of breathalyzer history a journey filled with tipsy husbands, colorful chemistry, and one heck of a catchy name, the Druncometer. Back in 1927, while the rest of the world was busy, 
Well, being sober, housewives were playing detective with W.D. McNally's mystical invention. It was like a real-life game of Clue, except instead of Colonel Mustard in the library, it was Mr. Smith with a whiskey on his breath. Rolla N. Harger took the baton in 1931 and ran with it, giving us the legendary drunkometer. Picture this, a contraption straight out of a mad scientist's lab, complete with bubbling beakers and a funky color-changing reaction. It was less scientific breakthrough and more cocktail party trick, but hey, it got the job done. Then, in 1958, along came Robert Frank Borkenstein, the breathalyzer wizard extraordinaire. Armed with a photometer and a sprinkle of potassium dichromate, he turned drunk detection into an art form. Suddenly, knowing your blood alcohol content was as easy as checking the weather forecast, sunny with a chance of sobriety. And just like that, the breathalyzer became the unsung hero of responsible drinking, the silent judge of boozy bashes everywhere. But let's not forget where we started. From makeshift chemistry sets to sleek keychain accessories, it's been one heck of a tipsy journey. So here's to progress, to innovation, and to never leaving home without your trusty breathalyzer. Because in a world where everyone's a designated driver, a little extra caution never hurt anyone. Cheers to staying safe and staying silly, one breathalyzer at a time. Hold on to your hats and buckle up, folks. If you think a breathalyzer's got tricks, wait till you meet this guy. Get ready for a roller coaster of laughter that'll make your head spin faster than a bartender shaking up a cocktail. Except this time, it's the kind of high spirits that'll leave you in stitches. Outside a bustling bar, Officer Murphy lurked in the shadows, eyes peeled for any sign of trouble. Officer Murphy was planning on giving the word entrapment a brand new meaning. And trouble wasn't hard to spot. Cue our star of the evening, stumbling out of the bar like a drunken giraffe on roller skates. This guy was a walking disaster, weaving through the parking lot like a pinball bouncing off bumpers. First, he tried to unlock every car except his own, as if testing out his own tipsy game of find the keys. Eventually, he hit the jackpot and stumbled into his car. But wait, the show was just getting started. With the grace of a baby elephant on ice, he flicked switches like a DJ at a rave. Lights on, lights off, wipers going wild. It was like his car was having its own tipsy dance party. Just when you thought the circus act was over, he decided to test his off-road skills and took a detour onto the grass. The officer watched, equal parts amused and bewildered, wondering if he stumbled into a live-action comedy show instead of a stakeout. But then, in a move that even had the officer questioning reality, the man pulled out onto the road, the lone survivor in the parking lot. The officer pounced, flicking on his lights like a kid at a light switch rave. Expecting to uncover a blood alcohol level that could power a small country, the officer whipped out the breathalyzer. But lo and behold, the reading came back as sober as a Sunday morning church service, 0.00. .00. The officer was dumbfounded, muttering about faulty equipment and cosmic conspiracies. But our hero had the ultimate punchline up his sleeve. With a grin witter than the Grand Canyon, he confessed, Tonight, officer, I'm the designated decoy. <laughs> our last story joke of the day is about a vasectomy and a nervous brother. In today's cartoon story joke, Get ready for a comedic whirlwind as Stan's routine vasectomy appointment takes an unexpected turn when his brother and sister-in-law burst in like characters from a daytime soap opera. It's a tale of sibling antics, parenting pressure, and one unforgettable punchline that will leave you in stitches. Before we unveil the comedic climax, let's sprinkle a dash of historical hilarity onto the proceedings. Ah, the colorful history of vasectomy it's like a wild ride through the annals of the reproductive innovation. Turns out, our ancestors were pioneers in the field of DIY birth control, whipping up potions and rituals that would make even the bravest warrior wince. Picture this, ancient texts from far-flung lands like India and China detailing methods that would make your toes curl. 
hot oil baths, anyone? And don't even get me started on those special plant and mineral concoctions. Let's just say they weren't exactly a walk in the park. Now, fast forward a few millennia, and we find ourselves in the early 20th century, where the concept of vasectomy was just starting to gain some, ahem, traction. Back in the 19th century, scientists were still scratching their heads about how tadpoles and eggs even got together for a little rendezvous. Talk about being late to the party. Enter Dr. J.J. Bruckner, the maverick German doc who decided to take matters into his own hands in 1823 with the first recorded human vasectomy. But let's be real, it wasn't until later that folks really started to take notice. Back then, vasectomy wasn't just about family planning, it was like the ultimate tool for population control, with some uh, questionable ethics thrown into the mix. Thankfully, we've come a long way since then, folks. Today, vasectomy is the go-to option for those looking to hit the pause button on parenthood. It's safe, it's effective, and it's provided us with enough awkward dinner party fodder to last a lifetime. So, here's to modern medicine, making family planning a whole lot less, um, uncomfortable. Cheers. Now let's cut through the awkwardness like a knife through butter. Well, you know, and dive straight into this side-splitting joke. Just as Stan is about to take the plunge into the world of vasectomies, his brother and sister-in-law storm into the room like characters from a daytime soap opera, their faces a mix of panic and urgency. You'd think they were about to foil a bank heist, not interrupt a routine medical procedure. Stop right there! You can't do this! His brother bellows dramatically, as if Stan is about to sign away his soul instead of just getting a simple snip. Perplexed, Stan raises an eyebrow and quips, And why? Pray tell. Not? His brother, clutching the newborn baby like it's a winning lottery ticket, launches into a passionate plea. Don't you want to experience the sheer bliss of fatherhood someday? Like my wife and I are currently reveling in? He gestures toward the baby like it's the holy grail of parenthood. Stan, in his typical poker-faced manner, remains silent, internally debating whether this is a sitcom or real life. Growing increasingly desperate, his brother implores, Come on, Stan. I want to be an uncle. Make my dreams come true. Stan, with a mischievous glint in his eye, turns to his brother and teases, Are you absolutely positively sure you want to be an uncle? His brother nods vigorously, practically bouncing with excitement. With a sly grin, Stan winked at his brother's wife and then drops the bombshell. Well, congratulations, dear brother. You're already holding your future nephew. <laughs> please join us again next week for more story jokes. And if you like our jokes, then please subscribe to our channel.